For today's program, we're honored to welcome back Tom Barkin. Tom's the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. He's held the position since 2018. He serves as a voting member of the Fed's uh, Chief Monetary Policy Committee, the Federal Open Market Committee. He's also responsible for bank supervision and the Federal Reserve's technology or organization. He's on the ground continually in the Fed's fifth district, which covers South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, DC, West Virginia, and Maryland. His engagement in the region has brought real attention to areas facing economic challenges. He earned his MBA and law degrees from Harvard University. And prior to joining the Richmond Fed, he was a senior partner and CFO at McKinsey. He oversaw McKinsey's offices in the southern United States uh, during his time there. The format today will begin with prepared remarks from Tom, followed by a conversation in which we're honored to have club member Michael Faroli as our moderator, Michael's uh, chief U.S. Economist, economist at J.P. Morgan. We're going to end promptly at 1 o'clock, and time permitting, they will take questions from members and guests in the room. As a reminder, this conversation is on the record, as we do have media on the line and in the room. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tom Barton to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I'm going to be a lot more interesting, I think, on questions than I am on this speech. So I'll, I'll talk quickly uh, for five or ten minutes about uh, what's happening in the economy. Um, I'm going to give you my views and not that of anybody else uh, in the Federal Reserve System. And then, um, you know, Michael and I, I think we'll have some fun uh, with the Q&A. So let, let me start just with the recent uh, data, which I would just say has been remarkable. 12-month um, PCE inflation is now at 2.6 percent. Core is at 2.9 percent. Six-month, six even seven-month uh, inflation are even lower. Core inflation for the last seven months has been 1.9%. Uh, and these 12-month numbers are absolutely going to get better over the next uh, few months because we're lapping numbers from the beginning of last year uh, that were pretty inflationary. At the same time, uh, contrary to most forecasts and, frankly, contrary to my forecast, uh, the progress on inflation has come while the economy has remained remarkably healthy. Uh, unemployment rate, 3.7%. Uh, on Friday, we added another 353,000 jobs. GDP growth in the last quarter of 2023, 3.3%. Uh, and frankly, if you had told me a year ago that I could come here and speak to you at a time uh, where inflation was 2.6% and unemployment was 3.7%, I would have accepted uh, that offer. Um, now, as some of you know, I don't uh, just like to depend on the published data. I spent a lot of my time uh, on the ground talking to businesses and I'm hearing uh, really good news from them too. Now, with the exception of some interest sensitive sectors like banking, commercial real estate, the tone outside of that has shifted decisively away from talking about a recession. Um, they may not be hiring as much, uh, but they're not firing either. And while price setters continue to try, uh, they seem more and more convinced that price increases are gonna be smaller, less frequent, and less likely to stick. Now, I take a lot of signal from the major consumer products manufacturers. And if you look at their uh, most recent earnings reports, uh, I was happy to see that their realized price gains have gone from in the high double digits, high teens, uh, mid-pandemic, to low single digits today. So now it seems like every conversation we have is one where we talk about a soft landing, a scenario where inflation returns to a 2% target while the economy stays healthy. Uh, and that could well happen. Um, if it does happen, it's going to defy almost all predictions of what happens when the Fed raises interest rates so quickly to fight inflation. And it would be even more surprising given the challenges we faced last year, from the banking turmoil in the spring to the Gaza conflict in the fall. Now, you can explain it. You can explain why inflation is settling uh, so quickly without much disruption. The extraordinary levels of post-pandemic spending have been normalizing. The painful post-COVID supply chain shortages have been largely resolved. The rebound in prime age labor force participation and immigration have helped alleviate labor market pressures. 
and most measures of inflation expectations have stayed remarkably stable, suggesting that businesses and consumers have found the Fed and our inflation target credible. In other words, they likely understood the inflation surge was temporary, and that with the help of Fed action, it's now behind us. So you might ask, why not declare victory and move rates back quickly to neutral levels? I assume in this room there are many who are going to ask that question in multiple ways. So let me be clear that nothing would, be, would make me happier than a return to a pre-pandemic economy. Uh, but I'll give you two uh, reasons for caution. First, uh, the airport's on the horizon, but the plane hasn't landed yet. And so for the nerds uh, among us, I like the visual of an unfinished negative parabola with the top being the peak of the pandemic recovery. And so just a few numbers. Annual GDP growth before COVID, about 2%. It hit 5.8% in 2021. Uh, it was down to 2.5% in 2023 on an annual basis, closing in on its trend growth rate of about 2%. Three-month average job growth, 214,000 before COVID, 727,000 in 2021. It's now 289, still above the replacement rate of about 100. And inflation, of course, which was just under 2% before COVID, rose to 7.1% in 2022. It's now at 2.6% on the way back to two. And so you've got inflation, you've got demand, you've got employment all on a good path, uh, all headed back toward uh, normal, but there's no certainty where they're headed. And if you're a demand pessimist, you could point to monetary policy lags, credit tightening, the narrowness of job gains, the potential for geograph geopolitical shocks, and you could worry about a downturn. Or if you're an inflation pessimist, you could point to continued strong wage growth and the recent drop in interest rates as fueling reacceleration. The Fed is committed to returning inflation all the way back to 2%. And as I think about that commitment, I can't help but look for lessons in the past. History tells a lot of stories of inflation head fakes. Uh, one I've been looking at lately is the end of the Volcker era. And for those of you who remember, in mid-86, inflation actually dropped under 2%. The Fed reduced rates. Inflation then escalated again quickly the following year, and the Fed had to reverse course. And I just love to avoid that roller coaster if it's at all possible. So that's one reason uh, for caution, which is that the plane hasn't yet landed. The second reason for caution is more fundamental. Um, and there's an old saying that says, no one returns from battle unchanged. And while our wars on COVID and our wars on inflation can't compare, obviously, to the horrors of an actual war, I'm still wondering how those experiences may have changed the economy because disruptive events can have lasting consequences. For example, the trend line of GDP growth before the Great Recession, we never came back to that trend line uh, afterwards. So what changes worry me? I'll talk about uh, the labor market, I'll talk about the housing market, uh, and I'll talk about uh, the global market. So first, the labor market, which certainly uh, has changed. Uh, labor force participation is down. Uh, employment is still over 4% under its pre-COVID growth trend. My generation, the baby boomers, is aging out of the workforce. Participation has dropped as well. The market was tight before the pandemic, and it's even tighter today. As evidence, wage growth, um, one measure is the Atlanta Fed's wage growth tracker, is still running at 5% annually versus 3.7% pre-pandemic. And this pressure on wages and potentially prices is likely to persist. Second change is the housing market. Uh, we're short housing supply. Uh, that's a topic I talked about in a speech last year. We underconstructed for a generation, and now the shortage of skilled trade workers and the recent increase in construction costs haven't helped. We've also seen demand increase. Uh, with interest rates low and work shifting partly to home, people look for new places to live. I mean, after all, nothing makes you more aware of the flaws of your current residence or your current roommate than spending every waking moment at home. Institutional investors added a demand. So did second home purchasers. So housing prices shot up across the board. Now the market's cooled a bit since, but with limited supply, prices remain high. And if housing supply continues to be short, that could mean further pressure on prices and rents in the coming years. Third change could be deglobalization. Now COVID laid bare the vulnerabilities associated with global supply chains. Businesses and consumers became painfully aware that a series of unfortunate events, a severe winter storm, a fired an overseas plant, or a blocked shipping lane could snowball into snarled supply chains, good shortages, and a spike in costs. We're seeing countries rethink their trading relationships and firms redesigning their supply chains to prioritize resiliency, not just efficiency. 
These changes would suggest higher costs and less ability for intermediaries to drive year-over-year -year efficiencies. And these forces could well put renewed pressure on goods prices as well. So looking forward, I'm hopeful, but still looking for more conviction that the slowing in inflation is broadening and sustainable. I talked about these three categories in part because most of the inflation drop so far has come from uh, a partial reversal of pandemic era goods price increases, which has more than offset uh, continued higher than normal increases in shelter and other services. Now the Fed's not in the game of picking the correct makeup of inflation. Our target doesn't specify how the price of individual items should change, just that the price index overall should increase by 2% over time. But the factors I discussed could hinder the continued deflation in goods and maintain pressure on shelter and services costs. A recent rebound in consumer sentiment, continued willingness of consumers to dip into savings, and a loosening of financial conditions could also introduce risk to the inflation outlook. Now, you could dismiss all these pressures as exerting only a fleeting impact on inflation in an otherwise stable environment, but I do worry about whether they could still influence expectations, which have been unsettled by the recent inflationary experience of the last few years. Um, the New York Fed's inflation uncertainty measure remains much higher, for example, than pre-pandemic levels. So it's possible we'll return to the pre-pandemic economy pretty seamlessly. It's also possible that the landing might be somewhat bumpier with continued inflation pressure or demand challenges that we'll need to counteract. That's why I think it's smart for us to take our time. You likely saw in last week's meeting that we acknowledged that the risks to inflation and unemployment are moving into better balance. And we stated that we don't expect it to be appropriate to cut rates until we gain greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward our 2% target. No one wants inflation to reemerge. And given robust demand in a historically strong labor market, we have time to build that confidence before we get, begin the process of toggling rates down. So thanks for uh, your time, and um, Michael and I are looking forward to a, a conversation. Thanks for that, uh, Tom. Very comprehensive remarks. I don't know where to begin. How about you mentioned it's easy to explain why inflation was, uh, has softened. Can, how do you explain why growth has not remained as resilient as it has? Well, so um, a lot of us predicted, maybe you did, I did, that with rates being up as fast and as far as they would, that we'd have uh, a much softer economy. But I think you have to look at it now and say, um, you've got 3.7% unemployment, so people are employed, uh, they're spending. You've got, uh, at least in the last year and a half, higher real wages, so people feel like they've got income they could spend. Um, asset values are up, uh, um, whether that's uh, houses or, or the equity markets. And the net of all this is that the savings rate which had been uh, four or 5% before the Great Recession, which went up to seven or 8% after the Great Recession, has been back down to levels 4%. So I think people are spending. Yeah. And I think that's really uh, the core of it. One fact I saw that I think is really interesting is that um, in aggregate, corporate interest payments as a percentage of revenues or it, personal interest payments as a percentage of personal disposable income, both of those numbers are now only finally back to pre-COVID levels. So in aggregate, you might think on the margin that interest rates are affecting the economy, and for sure they are if you're in banking or mm -hmm. real estate. But in aggregate, I don't think they've yet hit yeah. the economy the way you might think when you say, yeah, we went from 0% to 5%. Yeah, I guess it's the business side of the business sector that surprises me a little more. I mean, you would think the interest expense burden would have gone up in a way yeah. that a lot of people were predicting a lot of business bankruptcies at this point. And you talk to a lot of people in the fifth district. Why haven't yeah. we seen that? Well, so people refinance their loans. So the interest burden has come down, like I said. Um, and then we do the CFO survey. It's very interesting. Um, you know, optimism about the economy is low, but optimism about their own business is actually still yeah. pretty high. And I, I just think uh, everybody took the recession playbook out last year. A lot of people pulled the first couple levers, you know, maybe cutting back their hiring a little bit. But the next, you know, the next page in that playbook, which talks like, talks about reducing costs or cutting capital expenditures. They just can't get there while their business is still healthy. Yeah. And so month after month after month, people see their business being healthy. And while, if you will, they're prepared for the downturn, they're just not seeing it and they're not willing to cut back yet. Mm -hmm. That obviously puts some risk on the table, which is, you know, if something does happen that causes consumers and businesses to pull back in unison, that's how recessions happen. But you're just not seeing that kind of pullback yet. Yeah. One, uh, Thing people throw out there as to why 
restrictive policy hasn't impacted the economy is maybe it's not that restrictive. So um, plug for the Richmond Fed research staff. Mm -hmm. They put out the Lubick map as uh, Thank you. real neutral rate, which they estimate around 2%. Uh, I think that's probably a little high of what most people think is plausible, but but where do you think uh, where do you think this conversation is going to be heading? Yeah, so for those of you who aren't as deep into it, um, uh, the I say the center of the FOMC distribution in terms of what the real rate is would be about half a percent. There are more. There's, some of the people are now moving up to maybe it'll be in the range of one percent. Um, there are three or four really big models uh, in there, including you know one by John uh, here that. Uh, have very different answers. So the Lubick Mathis has a higher number. I'm not sure if the number ought to be 2% or a half a percent. Mm -hmm. um, what I do pay attention to is the standard error. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's it's 200 basis points. Yeah. And yeah. so actually, they may both be you yeah. know, in the zone of right. And, and so I think it's hard to decide where to take rates over time by the models. Sure. I think you have to, you know, I use the word toggle in my speech. I think there's a test and learn process where you know, you take rates toward the appropriate level and then you evaluate how the economy's reacting. And I do think this economy has not reacted to rates in the way that most forecasts would have said it have, it would have. Yeah. So in, in your prepared remarks, you invited, essentially invited questions about the first easing or the timing of when uh, policy might. If I was dying for questions on that, I apologize. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't my right, Maybe I misheard you. No, no. But <laughs> uh, so talk about confidence. Um, gaining greater confidence. Obviously, clearly lower CPI PCEs would do that. What outside of the inflation data itself would give you greater confidence that inflation going forward? Uh, so last seven months, core PCE uh, has been very good, 1.9%, uh, as I said. So some sustaining of that mm -hmm. would be helpful because the six months before that was 3.3%. It's one of those, do you believe this or do you believe that? Um, uh, the second thing I'd really love to see would be a broadening of mm -hmm. inflation. As I said, one thing that makes me a little nervous is um, it's really been driven by deflation in goods whose prices escalated given supply chain pressures during COVID. And I guess I always expected used car prices to come down. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how much signal I should take from used car prices coming down. We had no cars on lots. People bought used cars. They had to pay up. Now they don't. That That feels to me like a very heavy thing to hang a conclusion on. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to see a broadening. Um, the trim mean is another set of metrics that's obviously um, uh, good for looking at broadening. It's running still over 3%. So, you know, if you sort of stall more in the rent, uh, people have been predicting that yeah. the measures of rents would come down for some time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see them actually start to come down. Yeah. I'd like to see services settle. That's what I'm looking at. I'm not, I don't think it's so much on the economy, mm. but I will say that when the economy is as strong as it is, mm -hmm it's hard to feel urgency on taking yeah. rates down. I mean, right. if you had a weakening economy and you felt like you were dealing with that backdrop, you might take a little bit more chance on the, right. that, that's the trade off. Okay. So the strength of the economy adds a burden of proof to the- That's how I think about it. Yeah, okay. Um, now, some policymakers have mentioned you don't need to get all the way to 2% before you ease policy. If the last seven months annualized are one nine, as you mentioned, March is pushed back against March, that would seem to suggest that you're looking in like a, what, a two to four month horizon in which uh, you'd like to see inflation lower. Is that the right way to think about that? Well, the, the hard part with this question is it assumes a set of data that hasn't arrived yet. Sure. Fair. And so um, is your question, if we keep getting data that month after month after month looks like it's very consistent with 2% mm -hmm. broader, yeah, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's right, start right. normalizing rates. <laughs> what if the data bounces yeah. around right, right. in there? And so I yeah. think, um, similarly, you know, what are you going to see on the demand side? Are you going to mm -hmm. see a dramatic weakening in the economy, as I've suggested the demand pessimists might see? Or are you going to see strength 353,000 jobs a month like we apparently saw last month? Those are very different scenarios. Mm -hmm. And so in my mind, PC inflation sustained at this level and broadening, that's my criteria. Mm -hmm. And I'm not focused on the month as much as I am focused on the criteria. And right. I could imagine scenarios where that happens relatively quickly, and I can imagine scenarios where that takes time. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned uh, in your remarks an aversion to having to reverse policy as Volcker did. Can you just get a little more into that? I mean, it, a reversal in itself, if it doesn't affect, if you're still like attaining your inflation and employment objectives 
why should policymakers care if that happens with policy being adjusted in, in differing directions? I think it's more about um, the effects of uncertainty on the behaviors of uh, businesses and consumers, particularly businesses. Yeah. Um, you know, as I've talked to folks, so I've asked a lot of questions in the last three months about um, long rates, mm -hmm. which escalated significantly in the third quarter and then have come, you know, nicely off in the fourth quarter, probably 80 or 90 basis points off their off their peak. And when you ask questions about, well, how did long rates affect you or how does the um, the drop start to affect you, you do get a feel of people waiting to pull the trigger, whatever that trigger is, until they kind of get more confidence on where things are actually going. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, there is a sense that if you were to lower rates, that there's some amount of investment that's going to come online by people having confidence. And certainly there are industries like real estate and banking that are looking mm -hmm. for that. Um, and the same thing, and so if you move up or you, I, I just think there's some people need enough stability in the situation to have the confidence to invest. And I have no objection to reversing course if the right answer is to reverse course. But just as a risk management thing, I think you'd love to avoid, you know, moving hard left and then moving hard right. Yeah. So if there's an added burden of proof on the first move, then should one, I mean, I would think one might gain more confidence that the following move will be in the same direction. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of, uh, I'd say, a mini renaissance among academics of interest in lean against the wind uh, policies, I guess, led by former policymaker Jeremy Stein. Do you ever see that entering your policy calculus? If, I mean, look, if we do actually have a soft landing, um, HPA is looking pretty good right now. One might expect mortgage growth, et cetera, to pick up. Would that, would those factors enter into your calculus if we have a an economy that looks like the SEP that we've seen? Uh, and and you know, the Richmond Fed actually did a lot of the early work on lean against the when and is very passionate, you know, on this on this topic. Um, I, I think uh, I can't wait to get to the other end of this inflation episode and declare whatever version of victory one does in part because I think there's so much we're going to learn mm -hmm. out of what happened. In the last framework review, um, we said, you know, we were suspicious enough that inflation could come along that we really wanted to see it mm -hmm. before we'd start to, you know, lean against it based on forecasts. And that is what we did. And what's happened over the last two years has been the outcome of that. Now, mm -hmm. if what's happened is the Fed can, with its credibility, increase rates, and then inflation comes back to target, and it stays stably back there, that will tell you something about whether that tactic works if inflation comes that way. If it doesn't, and inflation is more bouncier and it takes you know years to converge, not months to converge, then we'll learn something else. And so, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot even in the next six months about how inflation settles after one of these episodes. That will therefore be evidence in mm -hmm. how nervous you have to be against. Yeah. forecast driven sense that demand is driving yeah. inflation that you have to lean against the wind on. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that we're closing in on right. some clarity, but I think it's still to come. Okay. So that, I mean, the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that when we get to 2% inflation in an environment of full employment, these factors would lead you to, to be biased higher uh, relative to some estimate of neutral. I mean, uh, if we are actually able to uh, deliver 2% inflation on a sustained basis in a relatively short order while demand stays at the levels that it's been, you know, recently, to me, that makes the case that neutral is somewhat higher than, mm -hmm. you know, previous projections. Right. I mean, you raise rates and the economy hasn't been hurt in that way. Um, I hope you noticed that in the statement I just made, there were about seven ifs. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, at, in your remarks, I sense a little bit of ambiguity, which I've also sensed from other Fed officials in recent weeks about where we stand in the growth inflation uh, dynamic, the Phillips curve, for lack of a better word. And, and to some degree, it sounds like, well, we're fine with whatever sort of real economic outcomes we get as long as inflation keeps doing what it does. On the other hand, you mentioned wage inflation and the Atlanta Fed measure running a little high. So maybe you could just expand on how you're thinking about the Phillips curve relation between labor market slack and inflation? Well, so maybe I should start by saying a little about how I'm thinking about the recent data, because mm -hmm. 
The recent data, 353,000 jobs suggests an incredibly vibrant labor market. You know, January is always a tough month to try to make any business judgments based on. Uh, just for those of you who aren't as deep in the numbers, normally we lose about 2.6 million jobs in January because um, the retailers who hire up for the Christmas season then lay people off. It then gets seasonally adjusted up to the number you see. So last month, we only lost 2.5 million jobs. And so with the seasonal adjustment, it took you up to 353,000. So we don't have better numbers. The people who do those numbers are doing the best job they possibly can. But those are the numbers we see, and those are the numbers you have to make policy off of. But I'm just a little cautious about deciding too much when you've got that big of a, you've got a month with that big of a seasonal adjustment. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means like to see a little more is I think a more rational thing when you see January. And for those of you who remember last January, we saw massive retail sales growth. We saw very significant inflation. We saw big numbers everywhere. It looked like we were in this huge reacceleration. And three months later, it didn't look like that at all. So you just have to be careful with the numbers, yeah, yeah. first point. Second point is uh, the Phillips curve, which uh, if you're like me, you learned about in college. And in, of course, uh, it has something to do with uh, unemployment and wages. And then you know, we've sort of extended it to say unemployment has actually something to do with prices. That last connection is a little attenuated. Mm -hmm. And certainly in 2019 and 2020, with very low unemployment rates, we didn't see inflation, uh, you know, uh, rear its ugly head despite a lot of forecasts. And so the short answer was the Phillips curve isn't flat. Now, there's also no question that in 2021, with labor being even shorter, we saw wages really spike. And mm -hmm. so um, there's some nonlinearity there you know, yeah. for sure. Um, I think about it a little less model-based and a little bit more, you know, uh, if an economy is running hot, right, in the way that at least the last six months numbers would suggest we might be doing now. Uh, and I think in an environment where price setters have now had the experience of raising prices and maybe a little more confidence that they could do it, does that put inflation at risk? And that's how I would think about it. And I think that's a fair way to, to think about the risk of an economy that's too hot, yeah, you, know, you get into some of the nonlinearities. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, okay, so it's more a matter of at very tight labor markets. Very and, tight. Yeah, and where do you? What's your assessment of labor markets currently relative to where we've been? I, I think they're tight, but I don't think they're as tight as the numbers would have you show. Mm -hmm. and, and and in particular, uh, I divide it into three segments. Uh, there's professionals, uh, and I think that market today is at normal. It's not at tight at all. Um, you know, uh, it was tight a couple of years ago when the big tech companies start laying people off. People go, oh, well, okay, maybe I like this job, right? I don't want to be the last yeah. guy in and the first guy out. So I don't think the professional segment, it feels normal. Mm -hmm. The frontline segment, which was way short after COVID, it's not all the way back to normal, but I think businesses have adjusted. And so your service is a little bit less good at a restaurant. Your room's getting cleaned, you know, every other day at a hotel. But folks have figured out how to get by with the frontline labor. The place that's still very tight is skilled trades and uh, nurses, truck drivers, uh, uh, carpenters, plumbers, welders. I'd even put veterinary assistants in there. Those were those are all segments where you actually have to, if I could put it this way, manufacture workers. And we were short pre-COVID and then demand in a lot of these segments spiked or retirement spiked. And we just don't have enough people. And there's still a wage ratchet going on you know, in construction, there's still a wage ratchet going on uh, in nurses, veterinary assistants, all those folks. Mm -hmm. That's the place where I think it's still. Yeah. Tight. Yeah. And if you look at the but, job gains, excluding the most recent month, um, you do see them very much increasingly in a narrow segment yeah. of, of occupations. Right. And that should be a relative price, relative yeah. wage matter, right? relative than, wage a, matter. than a broader macro concern. Um, I'm going to ask you a question you can't answer. Um, Good. Which is. <laughs> And but it's one that I think comes up quite a bit, and it, you kind of alluded to it when you said, you know, aren't we like basically close enough? Um, and I think there was a bit of after the last framework review, a little unease or however you want to put it about the two percent flexible average inflation targeting. How flexible is flexible? And uh, so, I mean, certainly you don't need to be two point zero to declare victory. Where can you just shed a little light on whether you think? it would help to have more specificity on that? Or do you think where we are now in terms of the framework and that ambiguity is constructive? So I get asked, another way to do it is I get asked a lot the question of, are you going to change the target? 
And yeah. generally the question is, hey, you're already at 2.6 or 2.9, why not just declare victory and go? Yeah. Yeah, the Fed's only got one uh, big lever, and that's credibility. And I just don't think if you set a 2% target and you quit at three, that anyone's going to have any credibility at three. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to hit your target to, do the credit, to maintain your credibility. And I'll also point out, it's not like 2% is some magical unicorn that nobody's ever seen. You know, we lived in it for the last 30 years. We're inches away now. We've been there for the last six or seven months. Uh, the world has a 2% inflation target, and lots of good things happen with a 2% inflation target. So I don't think it's impossible yeah. to get there. I have said before um, publicly that I, I'm very comfortable when we get to the next framework review debating the question of a range. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always felt to me a little strange that our target was two, and if we were at 2.1 or 1.9, we were going to somehow beat ourselves up yeah. in a world where it's a basket of 180 goods that comes in month after. I just... That's felt like uh, over precision yeah. for me. Um, I have to say with full transparency, I lost that argument yeah. in the last framework review. So I don't know <laughs> whether you should make policy well, over my yeah. arguing skills, but I'm, I, I do want to say that. Now, well, a modest range well, around it where you yeah. do try to, to hit it. And there are other central banks that, that operate yeah. with a yeah. range. Well, hopefully Rick, Rick Mishkin isn't going to be on that debate. But, yeah. um, let me ask about uh, what are your thoughts Clearly, I think around here, there's some concern about the regional banking system. Mm -hmm. um, I think you briefly alluded to it in your in your remarks. Maybe you could, could you expand a little bit on how you see that as a risk for the outlook? Yeah, so, um, so the Silicon Valley thing was very uh, front and center back in the spring. Uh, you had three or four banks, uh, idiosyncratic business models. Uh, but I think you learn something about liquidity in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they had big mark-to-market -market losses and uh, very low levels of uninsured deposits, and that didn't work out all that well. Um, the banks in my district, I'm talking to them all the time. I think everyone's taken on the lessons of that. And so access to liquidity facilities, uh, more insured deposits, mm -hmm. uh, working on their mark-to-market -market losses. So you know that, that seems to me like that was a last year issue, not a this year issue. The issues, though, of this year are, I'll say, twofold. Uh, one is the cost of firming up deposits was higher cost deposits. And so um, the banks I'm talking to are struggling with uh, shrunken margins. Mm -hmm. And so you know, with thinner margins, that has implications both for your willingness to take on marginal credit, uh, as well as uh, your focus on reducing costs. And there have been a number of announcements on cost reduction stuff at various banks you know, over the last few yeah. months, and even a little M&A, uh, at least in my district. Mm -hmm. um, in, a, in addition, you've got this commercial real estate risk that's out there. And you know, I should say commercial real estate is this big, but data centers are doing fine, and retail's doing fine, and hotels are doing fine, and most people who are holding apartments are doing fine. Some of the buildings are having issues. So it's really office is the big issue, and, and particularly downtown uh, B&C office. And I was in D.C. yesterday where that entire downtown you know, yeah. office complex is at high risk, and, yeah. and that is a risk. Uh, for banks. It's not an unknown risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, 74, 75, 90, 91, 07, yeah. 08. I mean, we've had uh, commercial real estate office issues before. And I do believe that sector has that kind of trouble yeah. now. The hope and expectation is that the banks have planned for that, whatever combination of appropriate losses, uh, reserves, and, and capital. Uh, I'll say we've stress test the banks that we've stress test pretty hard. Mm -hmm. on commercial real estate. And, you know, we published the results of that, which were relatively reassuring. But, you know, you don't know what you don't know yeah. in terms of whether there are banks out there that have exposure that isn't yeah. properly accounted for. Right. You know, D.C. really needs the federal workers back. Yeah, it, it's really um, it's really striking. I My district goes South Carolina through Maryland, so I get to be in lots of markets. And, you know, if you're in Greenville or you're in Charleston, you don't feel like there's a, a downtown office space kind of issue. But if you're in D.C., it is, and I met with a bunch of real estate folks mm -hmm. in the morning yesterday. It's quite palpable, you know, just how uh, uh, how low occupancy is, and and frankly, how little hope they have mm -hmm. to bring those businesses building yeah. back. Uh, one last for me, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, you had mentioned the structural, or the long term, I should say, undersupply of housing uh, right now. Uh, is that a monetary policy issue, or or more of a societal issue? Big societal issue, For sure. um, uh, a big societal issue. And um, and I, I gave a speech on this in November uh, 
because I really think there is a supply mm -hmm. challenge. And again, in my district, I get to go, if you, if you did an hour radius around Raleigh, um, you'll see the national home builders are there in force and they're building 250, $300,000 houses in Clayton and Smithfield and Wilson and Siler city and all these places. But if you go to Maryland, there's still short housing and you can't find much of any building. So there's something about how do we get enough housing supply in, in markets? And it's not just about inflation and unemployment. It's about mm -hmm. um, people's aspirations. And there's those who think that the part of the decline in consumer sentiment is a sense that you can't have the life that your parents had and, you know, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, for us as a policy, it gets to rents, yeah. you know, and, uh, and uh, occupancy costs and shelter is a big part of these indices. And it's a big part of people's cost of living. And so if you don't have enough supply and rents are going to continue to escalate, then that puts pressure on inflation. And so that's yeah. that's the policy part. Right, right. I see. Um, I think for Q&A, this is a small enough room that people can just raise their hands and speak up. Uh, sir, or maybe there isn't, Mike, I guess. Never mind. Forget what I just said. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Would you be able to expand in your comment that uh, office B and C markets don't have much hope <laughs> coming back? No, I was just talking about the the D the, the folks I talked to in DC. Okay. The, the, the DC. I mean, look, the um, a really interesting question is going to because the, the these these places have been hit by multiple things at the same time. Um, uh, but the new one is how much people work in, in an office. And so uh, it, as I'm walking around our district and I'm talking to uh, developers, what I'm hearing is that the trophy properties are actually doing fine because if you want to bring people back to office, having a really nice office with, you know, that's doing well. The issue is the renewals they're getting in these less high quality downtown, off the suburban offices are also doing fine. Um, and it's a particular issue in DC because you don't have the government back. And so much of the downtown office in DC is, lobbyists and law firms and others who actually do their business with the, the government. So that I was just talking about um, that. We'll see what happens to uh, use of office space. There have been many efforts over the years, as you know, to take the amount of office space and then it sort of creeps its way back up. Um, but we'll see about that. Repurposing, I think, is very hard. So, But it, it's, it's definitely a challenge segment right now. Again, not the first time you've had a commercial real estate challenge. And we get to the other side of these. Uh, maybe, sir. Right here. Over, overnight, we saw there was quite a sharp um, drop in the inflation numbers from China. Do you see there's any risk of that spreading kind of over here? Is there any sort of follow through effect to the US market? Yeah, so, um, so China has been very deflationary over the last year. Um, to the extent that we import a lot of goods from China, that has actually played out nicely in our efforts to settle uh, inflation uh, here. Um, you're asking me to now take my head off and say, am I worried about deflation? And it's almost like taking my head off and thinking about uh, something new. I guess there's always a risk there, but I'm not, um, you know, outside of a few goods categories whose prices escalated during the pandemic, I'm not seeing, you know, much, if any, focus on prices coming down. Remember, our economy is heavily a services economy, heavily buoyed up by wages. Seems to me like it'd have to be quite a situation to start bringing wages down. So I, I think the risk here is very different than the risk in China. Can I ask, so you had mentioned, and this is related, um, the New York Fed survey measure shows mm -hmm. increasing inflation disperse, dispersion, basically. So they ask consumers their inflation expectation, and it looks how uncertain people are. And that has gone up. Where else do you see sort of a lasting imprint or something that will persist even as we get to the other side of this or a risk of that persisting? On the inflation side? On the inflation side, yes. Well, we do our own thing. In our last CFO survey, we asked sort of the same question mm -hmm. of businesses, which is your expectations for next year are you're going to be raising prices at sort of pre-pandemic levels, higher than pre-pandemic levels, lower than pre-pandemic mm -hmm. levels. And it was about 55% that were above pre-pandemic levels. Now, talk is cheap. Yeah. And that was a November survey of what they expected to do this year. Mm -hmm. And some number of them will try and the customers will beat it back and some numbers will change their mind. But I, I just think if you're a price setter in this economy for the prior 30 years, the combination of globalization, e-commerce, power of big box retailers mm -hmm. um, just beat you into submission in terms of your inability to, to raise prices. Pricing was not a lever. 
today, I think in every boardroom, as you're coming up with your plan and you're short at the last minute, someone's saying, well, maybe we should give price a try. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it's going to stick. Mm -hmm. But I just think it's on the lever list in a way it wasn't really on yeah. the lever list yeah. five years ago. Right, right. Thank you. Interesting. There was uh, maybe right up front here. So we know so we know that the Fed is uh, is a political body. But how do you factor in this the dysfunction in Washington, particularly as we get closer and closer to the election? Um, I don't know if you watched Jay on 60 Minutes over the weekend. I might just defer to him. I thought he was brilliant. And the last question for those who didn't see it is he said, you know, uh, integrity is priceless and we're just not going to waste ours. Um, you get to a meeting. Uh, the decisions are, I think, determined by the data you see. It's not, you're not trying to solve uh, the world. You're trying to solve inflation and unemployment. That's the mandate. That's what you do. And I think you just keep your head down and you focus on that. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe over here. I think we've not had anyone on this side of the room yet. How much, how much emphasis do you put on the, you know, the, the the views of the stock market and equity markets? Uh, we've been seeing a huge move when you when you're formulating a decision, when you're sitting in a room, other members does it come up? Or I'd like to know the thought process. Yeah, I try not to pay a ton of attention to the equity markets in part because they move up and they move down and, and I don't really understand them. So, you know, uh, I mean, a more serious answer is if you uh, uh, if you think about consumer spending, it's certainly buoyed by a wealth effect, not a massive effect. But, you know, and if equity values are up, that means people have more money. That means they're more likely to spend. So it has a consumer spending effect. And similarly, if you see big market drops, it often leads to consumer spending pullbacks. I think on the business side, too, when your stock's up, you're more confident you're going to invest in the future. So there's some correlation there. I spend a lot more time trying to think about the bond market, actually, because our policy goes to the economy much more directly through rates uh, than, than asset values. And so I, I just think that that's probably a more important thing. And if you read the minutes, you'll see it at every meeting we're sitting there talking about what's happening in the the minutes will show you we're not spending a lot of time talking about the equity markets. And again, the movements can be so volatile that it's, uh, you know, you could get whiplash. Um, questions over here, maybe uh, someone to ask. Hi, thanks for your talk, Alana Khan. Uh, just a different question from the data. Uh, just wanted to see your personal thoughts and from the Richmond Fed point of view, how did you, uh, how did you, what's your thoughts on the inclusive growth and income inequality and what Fed could play any role in that? Yeah, so, I mean, income inequality is a huge issue uh, for society, for this country. Um, uh, inclusive growth is as well. Um, you know, I, I and we have a lot of very good researchers who do a lot of very interesting work on various elements of that, um, because it does matter for growth of the economy. I, I've struggled, um, though, with how to think about the Fed's role for that, because we sort of have one tool, and it's called interest rates, and they go up and they go down. And if you're in commercial real estate, you know what that feels. But if you're interested in more inclusive growth, it's not actually <laughs> easy to imagine how exactly we're going to change that with our one tool. It's just a blunt instrument. Uh, for both of those questions, and I think both those questions are best answered, you know, through through means that are different than raise the interest rate twenty five basis points or lower at twenty five basis points. Thanks, Tom. It's very helpful. So you talked about a lot of numbers, right? Uh, low inflation, high employment, strong GDP growth. The average American still feels very down about the economy. How do you reconcile that? And also, how do you take that confidence into account on policy setting. Yeah, thanks. So one of the um, you know great uh, uh, paradoxes of, of the last few years is normally when consumer sentiment's down, consumer spending drops. And what we've seen over the last two years, as you rightly point out, is that consumer spending has plummeted. And con I'm sorry, consumer sentiment's plummeted while consumer spending has escalated. So what, what's going on there? Uh, and um, I did a really interesting thing with a bunch of construction workers in Northern Virginia, um, where I asked them, uh, you know, how do you feel about inflation? And they go, hate it. And I said, well, how do you feel about your wages? And they go, thank God, um, somebody finally recognized my value. And I said, well, 
your wages are up more than your expenses. You must be happy. And they're like, no, I earned the wages. Somebody's screwing me with, with the things. And, and I really think, I think if you're a business, um, it's easy to have a mental ledger. It's called margin. And if your prices go up and your costs go up and your margins go up, you can kind of live with that. But if the margins go down, you can't. That's how businesses think. I don't think consumers have a mental ledger like that. I really do believe that wages are what you deserve or they need to be bigger to get what you deserve. And costs, prices, or that's what someone is doing to you. And I just don't think they work that mental ledger. And I think that sentiment about inflation um, is what's driving uh, the sentiment overall. And I do think it's not a good thing, I guess, that we learned it, but I do think we've relearned over the last two years just how much everybody hates inflation. I mean, it's really been very reaffirming for what we try to do because I remember you know, debates about you know, how much does inflation really matter versus unemployment? People really, really, really hate inflation. How will that inform the framework review? The upcoming framework review? We'll see. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, uh, it'll, it's every five years, so we'll see when we get yeah, there. Right. Um, but, but to me, it's a little bit more around the question of how much risk are you willing to take on inflation? Yeah. yeah. And it, it, some people call it the whites of your eyes part of the mm -hmm. framework review, which is, do you have to see it to do something about it? We talked about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. That, that's where I think that would come up. Right. Maybe in the back, or I'm sorry, maybe maybe you first, and then you after he gets. The... I'm going first. Yeah, you go first. Sorry. Um, uh, you spoke a lot about the housing market, um, and of course about what's the lingering components of inflation that are that still have to come down, which is primarily rents. Um, you know, of course, we know that you know OER. You know, it's not a cash flow, right? Nobody pays that, um, and we've seen the strength in the economy. Is part of that maybe because we see this inflation, but the vast majority of people, especially homeowners, obviously are not experiencing the OER component uh, of inflation. Um, and then I'll just give a, maybe a little assist on the inequality question. I, I tend to think of inflation as very regressive. Uh, you know, the wealthiest folks don't experience it in the same way as, uh, you know, less wealthy folks. Uh, and, you know, maybe perhaps, uh, you know, that's why it's so important for you guys uh, to be fighting inflation. I mean, obviously, unemployment's regressive, too. And so, you know, the, the mandate's beautiful. If you can get low inflation and high employment, you know, you do help with all kinds of things. But, it, you know, it's a... And your first question was, oh, people don't pay. Well, I do think there's something to uh, inflation is not being experienced by everyone the same. And when you look at spending um, and you talk to retailers, you do, I do have a strong sense that the wealthy half of the economy has continued to spend, you know, if you want to put it this way, like drunken sailors. Um, you know, international trips, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, more towards services than goods. But that is that that part is very strong. And when you talk to retailers who service the bottom half of the economy in terms of income, you know, what you hear is a lot about reprioritizing and people being stretched and prices being up, even for folks whose real wages may have gone up because they're in entry level jobs where the, the wages have increased. So I do think it's very different there. And so you may well be right that the people in the bottom end are experiencing more of actual rent and less of, you know, imputed rent in the house, and, and, and that's part of it. But I think it's also just wealth in general. Um, the, the top half of the economy has the assets, and the extent that your house is worth 45% more and your equities are worth 40% more, you feel like you've got more money and you'd, you'd spend that. So you mentioned a depleted savings rate and an aging population that's also living longer. What are the consequences of the aging population that's also living longer on longer term interest rates? I thought you were gonna ask me to solve the question of them living longer. And I was trying to think about where <laughs> I was gonna go with that. Um, well, so, so what you're referring to is the, uh, the theory of the neutral rate, uh, you know, has a lot to do with the savings flood that a lot of people thought was, you know, created in, in all the savings, therefore bring rates down and all the rest of it. And so, you know, as people live longer and longer and they go into the era where you're no longer making any money, you're just spending money, won't savings come down? And doesn't that mean that um, long-term rates will go up? That, that's, I think, the premise you're putting down. And, um, you know, I, I do think that the combination of demographics globally um, and, uh you know, fiscal spending globally means that we may well see uh, less demand for longer term bonds and therefore higher rates. We'll see. Many of you are in the markets and you know this stuff a lot better than I do. But I mean, that argument makes intuitive sense to me. 
this one here. Sorry. Um, you talked a little bit about changes um, since the pandemic. Um, one of the things that we've seen more recently is, is differences in the surveys and different survey measures of things. Um, has it been harder, not, not that anybody's doing a poor job collecting the survey data, but it, has it been harder to get responses and is that driving differences in household versus business surveys and how do you incorporate less data that might not be as good as it once was um, in your decision making? Well, I think um, everyone from pollsters to surveyors are finding lower response rates. And how much of that is cynicism or behavior and how much of that is hard to find people on their cell phone and you know they don't respond, I don't know. But that's clearly an issue. And that has to mean that the data you get month to month is less reliable. Right now, they get more and more data, they revise it, um, and it's the best we've got. And your only good option is to make policy with the data uh, you've got. But I do think you have to be aware that there's less reliability in that data than you might have hoped you would have. And it's like the example I gave you of January labor numbers. Big seasonal, and the seasonal adjustments have changed too because COVID was a roller coaster. So I, I think, yeah, a little bit more caution is probably appropriate in a world where you might have less confidence in the data. The other thing that, um, that I try hard to do is to find alternative sources that might give you more information. Um, you know, one thing that at least I didn't track before the pandemic that I now track every week is consumer credit card spending. It's not perfect. You can have mixed shift in terms of payments vehicles. Excuse me. But it just gives you some amount of sense of what's actually happening versus just the data you get. And I think that's very useful.